but Brendan always believed that the thaw would eventually come. I ran up here every single day and got to the stage of just being a place of personal internal freedom. And it was, it was like a spiritual recharging. This brought you back to earth again. This brought you back to being a person. Very important, very important to me. I knew the British would be back. I knew it. So it was a matter of simply waiting. When Margaret Thatcher was toppled and John Major entered Downing Street, the ice began to melt. But by this time, Michael Oatley was due to retire. I developed a feeling that in my last year um, in government that I would like to make use of my connections one more time to see if I could have any influence on the situation before I retired. It seemed to be a pity just to walk away and leave it all as something one simply remembered. So I had conversations about that, and it did seem um, during 1990, 1991, early part, that, um, that there might be a mood developing within the provisional leadership where a political strategy as an alternative to violence might be something that they would consider pursuing. Brendan had the same feeling and suggested Oatley should pay one last visit to Derry. Bernie cooked dinner, and there was a particular reason why Brendan had invited Michael Oatley. Knock comes the door, back door, and Bernie said, who that? Is that? I said, I forgot to tell you that's Martin. <laughs> so she says, uh, I don't have enough dinner left and we've eaten it all. And I says, he's not here for dinner. McGinnis came up here and I sat in that chair for the end of the day and sat down and the two of them started chatting. I would say it was like a couple wanting to get together to enter a courtship. I thought him very serious and responsible about the situation that he occupied. I didn't see him as somebody who actually enjoyed uh, getting people killed. So I found him a good interlocutor, rather in some ways, rather like talking to um, a um, middle-ranking British Army officer of one of the tougher regiments like the Paris or the SAS. And it was at that moment that the, the, the Martin, this Martin, the Deputy First Minister Martin, began to emerge. I'm sitting listening to this, right? I'm sitting listening to McGuinness, uh, a McGuinness that I'd never actually saw before. I mean, there's a guy I know for 25, whatever years it is, never saw before. And I'm watching McGuinness emerging. A few weeks later, the IRA mortared Downing Street. What sort of signal did that send to the British? If I can get this over to you and your listeners, that's how it works. This department bombs, this department talks. That's how it works. Talks now seemed more remote than ever. Michael Oakley had gone, and with him, the government's direct link to Brendan. In Derry, four months later, Brendan reluctantly agreed to meet an unexpected visitor. He said he wanted to create jobs in the city. He introduced himself as Mr. Ferguson. Now he starts talking and I'm getting switched off completely. He puts his hand in his inside pocket and brings out a letter. And I takes the letter and I looks at it and it's from Peter Brook. And at that particular moment, I knew that it was all over. That second. Mr. Ferguson was, in fact, an MI5 agent called Robert, 
Just months after the Downing Street attack, the Northern Ireland Secretary Peter Brook was reactivating the link. I knew that John Major and Peter Brook could not be sending somebody over to talk to me if it wasn't the beginning of the beginning. John Major is the guy who really took the courage in his hand and done this. For almost two years, Robert gently played himself in, secretly feeding Brendan advanced copies of government speeches to be passed on to the IRA. They indicated political flexibility if, and only if, the IRA ended violence. In February 1993, the government received a remarkable secret message that suggested the IRA was in a mood to do business. It said, the conflict is over, but we need your advice on how to bring it to a close. The message was a time bomb waiting to explode. The government responded four days later, and Brendan began preparing the ground for new secret talks. Two delegates were to represent the IRA, one of them Martin McGuinness. Robert was to represent the government. But just three days before the talks were due to take place, the IRA bombed Warrington, injuring 56 people and killing two little boys aged 3 and 12. Warrington actually spurred me on to say it has to end. Warrington practically stopped the process and the difficulty was continually renewing the dialogue uh, in the midst of these things, those two young boys being... Uh, blown to pieces. After Warrington, the British government pulled out of the scheduled talks. Robert is saying he can't make the meeting, and, that, uh, and I says, Robert, we've got a situation where two senior Republicans are prepared to meet you, and there can be progress. If you don't come, I'm finished. I says, Robert, I'm totally serious about this. These people are in Derry at this moment. And he says, I'll ring you in half an hour. And he rang back in four minutes and he says, I'll come. So was Robert going against instructions? I would assume so, yeah. I would think so. That's why I admire the guy so much, you know. I mean, the world is full of everybody that does the right thing. And then occasionally, you know, there's people who cross the line. If he hadn't have done what he did, we could still be hearing the bombs going off. Today? Today. Three days after Warrington, the two sides met in Brendan's house. Brendan sat through the meeting. Robert managed to persuade the IRA to agree to a two-week suspension of operations. Sinn Féin subsequently published its own account of what was said. What the Sinn Féin account of that meeting mm. says is, under the circumstances, quite remarkable because mm. it says that Robert says mm. the final solution is union. Mm. It's going to happen anyway. Mm. Unionists will have to change. Mm. This island will be as one. Mm. Did Robert really say that? Yes. He did? Yes, but what is missing in that is that Robert also said that the British government would never abandon the Unionists, per se. Things started to move, okay. and in May, both sides exchanged documents via Brendan outlining their proposals for peace. But progress was slow. The IRA was convinced the government was dragging its feet and carried on killing, culminating in the bombing of a fish shop on the Loyalist Shankill Road. Ten people died. A week later, John Major gave a stinging response to the suggestion that he should talk to the IRA. I can only say to the honourable gentleman, that would turn my stomach over and that of most people in this house, and we will not do it. So when John Major yes. later says, it would turn my stomach to talk to Gerry Adams, i.e. the IRA.